Y'all, it's Wednesday. We are live. We are not normally live on a Wednesday. So we're all here to talk about one particular case. That's when we tend to do off schedule law nerd rides. And tonight we are talking about the extensive, extensive Josh Duggar detention hearing. Yes, I was present. Um, at the entire hearing, yes, we're going to talk about it. Yes, I will put up warnings where appropriate and necessary. Let me tell you how we're going to break it down and then we're going to get into it. I'm going to talk about what the court ruled while backing up. I'm going to talk about how we approach topics like this with kind of the, the facts, not fuckery attitude that we embrace over here on my channel as law nerds. Then we're going to talk about the court's ruling. Then we're going to talk about what we learned from the witnesses that testified. There were four witnesses that testified today. Then I will give you kind of my take on it and what this, if this changes the position of the case, what I think the strongest arguments will be from the government prosecutors and from the defense attorneys moving forward in this case. And then I'm going to answer your questions. So that's how we're going to do it. I'm not going to be getting deep into the nature of the case until we talk about the witnesses that testified so that if you want to just watch what the court ruled and talk about what the court ruled on and not get into the kind of the deeper, literally darker stuff, uh, you can do that. If you're part of the replay crew, replay crew, we love you. Uh, it'll be timestamped down below after I'm done live streaming so that you can find the parts of the video that are appropriate for you. Uh, this video is not monetized. If YouTube puts ads on it, I have no control over that. They did change their terms of use so that they can do that. Uh, it just, there are some things that don't feel right. This is one of them. So this video is not monetized. There are resources down below where you can A, learn more about this type of child exploitation and B, see what resources there are there to either educate yourself, educate family, or help. Those are linked down in the resources box below. And with that, we are just going to get into it. It is a lot. Hey there. If we haven't met yet, I'm Emily D. Baker, the badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator. I'm the host of The Emily Show, and I break down the legal shit behind the news and pop culture stories we all want to talk about. I have been a licensed attorney for over 15 years, but this is not legal advice. I should warn you, I'm a big fan of the cursey words. This channel is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not fuckery. So first, a reminder, if you are new here, welcome. I'm Emily. I'm your resident internet lawyer. Um, I've been an attorney for over 15 years. As it said, I'm a former deputy district attorney, so I'm a former prosecutor. So if you hear my voice shift as I talk about these things, that is literally me shifting into prosecutor mode. Sometimes you can hear it when I'm like getting very technical. If it feels technical and a little detached, it's because I have shifted into, into court voice that's a personal protection mechanism. And I do that sometimes, particularly when talking about cases that involve uh, abuse, sexual abuse, and minors. So if you hear that, that's exactly what that is. When we talk about these cases, the things to remember, legality and morality are two very different things. So what the law requires and what we might want to see happen are sometimes two separate things. Um, <laughs> so the morality of how we feel about a thing and what the law says and allows are two different things. The, de the defendant has constitutional rights and they are absolute. And that is part of what the court must protect in a hearing like this. So in the chat, you will see that the mods are going to be kind of very heavy handed with not um, talking smack on people. We're not disparaging people. We are talking about this case. We are talking about these allegations. We are not talking about whoever else might be involved, who you might feel is culpable, who you like, who you don't like. Defendants that we fucking hate the most in the core of our being 
are entitled to absolutely the same rights as if it was our own family member who we believe is 100% innocent and love the most. So that is how we run our chat. I appreciate you so much um, for adhering to that because we keep the chat as a safe place for discussion without uh, really, you know, besmirching people or, or casting judgment. So though these are the types of charges where when one wants to cast judgment, um, the emotions lean towards fuck all of this shit. I get it, but fuck all of this shit. Um, come separate and apart from what the court has to rule in um in a case in any case but in a detention hearing like this. So thank you all for that. I see your super chats. I am going to get to all of the super chats uh when we get into questions at the end and I will get into questions and chatting with the chat and stuff at the end. I want to make sure that those who come in to figure out what the court ruled and hear about the legality of it can do that and then um, we will, we will shift into super chats and all that kind of stuff. So thank you. I will get to questions after we talk about the court ruling, uh, the new evidence and stuff like that, because I try to keep it. I mean, it's never going to be concise. We're long content. <laughs> we are a long form content channel here on the YouTube, but uh, I will try to keep the topics concise so that I can timestamp them. With that, we should absolutely get into the court's ruling. We've talked about the facts, not fuckery of it all. We've talked about the morality and legality of it all. And I think everybody feels that these charges are the worst. So I'm going to do a quick recap of what this case is about. This, this case just came up. This is a detention hearing. So let's, let's talk about the detention hearing real quick and the judge's ruling. Swoop. In the Duggar case, Josh Duggar was arrested um, on two counts of and relating to CP. I refer to it as CP when I'm talking about the charges. When I talk about the items themselves, you might hear me switch and I might switch between CP and um, child sexual abuse images. I will interchange them because the language of the law is possession of CP, but the images themselves are really child sexual abuse images. So I will switch between the two when I talk about the images, but the crime, the title of the crime in the U.S. code is still CP. He is charged with, you know, possession of it, and he is charged with, as my mind has already started running ahead of me, <laughs> possession of it and uh, downloading it. So receipt of it and having it receiving the thing, having the thing. I did a whole video breaking down the indictment and talking about that. Today is May 5th. Yesterday, his attorneys filed a motion in the court. It was their response in opposition to the government's motion for pretrial detention. During the arraignment hearing, the arraignment hearing is when a defendant is first told of their charges. At the arraignment hearing, the government made an oral motion for detention, saying to the court, we're asking that this defendant remain detained, that means in custody, in jail, until a trial on this matter. Now, there are rules about bond and the right to bond. I will interchange them between bond and bail because I was a state attorney and we talk about bail. Some jurisdictions call it bond. Same, same uh, for our purposes. There is a bail you know, the Bail Reform Act that preserves the rights to not be in custody if there are less restrictive means available to prevent someone from fleeing and protect the community. And that is the argument that the defense made here. So the judge put this over from last week till today to have a hearing with regard to whether Josh Duggar should be allowed out of custody 
if that would be with conditions, without conditions, where he would live, those sorts of things. The court indicated, and I put this up on Twitter um, after the arraignment hearing, the court indicated that there, if there was going to be bond in this case, that there would be conditions of that. They didn't even argue over the amount of bond in this case. It was really about the conditions where he would live and if he would be allowed to even post bond and be released from custody. I am going to talk about the court ruling real, well, not real, it's not going to be real quick. And then we'll talk about the new things that we've learned. But that's really a summary of where we are with the cases. Uh, it depends on if these run concurrent, how much time he's facing. Uh, some say 40 years, some say 20 years. It looks like with the concurrent sentencing, it would probably be in that 20 range. The minimum, minimum, minimum is five years on this. So if convicted of any of these charges, count one particularly, which is the receipt, has a minimum state prison sentence of five years, and that becomes relevant to the court's ruling. So while we're addressing this backwards, we're addressing it backwards so that I can give all of the trigger warnings before we talk about the content of the testimony today. This hearing started at 1.30. There were some technical issues. The court, the court clerk, the court again all made notes that this was not to be recorded. It was not to be uh, recreated, distributed. It was not to be, you know, live tweeted or anything like that. It was also in the email that came with the information to access the Zoom call. There were at the beginning of the Zoom call about 75 participants. After that, it kind of dropped down to about 63. This was a very, very long hearing. Uh, as I said, four witnesses. But the court came back into session to issue a ruling at 5.42 p.m. Central Standard Time from a 1.30 hearing. It was a very long hearing, and that's part of why uh, Josh Duggar will be released tomorrow. So when the court issued their ruling, the court very well, and I really liked this judge. I also like watching Southern courts because I like seeing the y'alls of it all. And um, some of the, some of the, I think the court said Mike could at one point. And I was like, oh, it's so Southern because this again is being heard in Arkansas. The judge came back to rule. She was very, very detailed in her ruling and very linear in making sure particularly that Josh Duggar understood as it became clear that she was going to be releasing him, that this was this was a opportunity to be out on bond, that there would not be second chances here. And she went through the different factors that the courts required to consider and did say, I have been thinking about this since the people made the motion last week regarding bond. It's very clear that the court did not take this lightly and was really balancing the severity and nature of the charges in this case, the evidence presented by the people in this case, and balancing that with the defendant's constitutional rights and the least restrictive means necessary to guarantee that he is not a flight risk and you know safety of the community. So we're going to get into what the court said with that ruling right now. The um, it was interesting because when the court came back in to rule, they had had to move Josh Duggar from where he was before in the jail to where he was to hear the ruling. And they locked up the iPad in the lockbox, but they were doing things in the jail and he couldn't mute and unmute himself on the Zoom call. So it was actually quite loud, which was interesting. The court started their ruling with thanking counsel, thanking them for how um, well prepared they were. The court made it clear that there had been a procedural meeting between the attorneys earlier in the morning about how they were going to be proceeding with the hearing. I think there's a lot of awareness of how much attention this case had. And the court and counsel wanted this hearing to go smoothly. And it really was a very smooth hearing but for a few technical hiccups, uh, the witnesses presented well. There were only a few objections. Again, it's a bond hearing, so the rules of evidence are a bit different. The standards are different and lower. But we did get a glimpse, I think, of what the prosecution's case will be and what the defense arguments will be, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. The court really did talk about the standards very clearly. And I got the sense that the court not just wanted Josh Duggar to understand, but also wanted the audience and the people 
uh, listening in and watching in on the Zoom call to really understand why this ruling was the way that it was. The court started out by talking about the fact that these charges have a presumption of detention. That means it is presumed that you stay in jail but it's a rebuttable presumption, meaning the defense can show evidence to show why somebody is entitled to be released or should be given the opportunity to be released. That's what the rebuttable presumption is. The court then said the hurdle to rebut the presumption is very low and only some evidence is required. And once the court was like, this is a rebuttable presumption, the hurdle is very low and only some evidence is required. I was like, and he's getting released because the court in that sentence really indicated the way this ruling was going to go, but still made the court's feelings known on the evidence that was presented. The court then went into um, all of the different factors they were considering under the applicable code sections of the U S code. That includes the nature and circumstances of the crime. The court went through the, evidence that was presented by the prosecution and by their lead investigator, well, their senior investigator who was training another investigator, so not technically the lead investigator, but not to get into the weeds on it, but their senior investigator in this case. And the court went through what they thought about that. I'm going to dive into that evidence after we talk about the court's ruling. So I'm not going to get into those factors yet. If you want to know what the court said about them, I'll let you know. But the court said the nature and circumstances of this crime um, was very concerning to the court and weighs heavily against Josh Duggar. The court then looked at the weight of the evidence and talked about the weight of the evidence presented. The court said that the weight of the evidence is substantial, that uh, the court is also aware that Duggar has a presumption of innocence, that this is not a trial, that this was not an evidentiary hearing in that way. This was a detention hearing, but that the evidence was not insubstantial in this case, that it was clear that the government went to extensive lengths to tie this evidence together to this defendant, and that the weight of the evidence absolutely factored against Duggar. The court then went into weigh the history and characteristics of Duggar himself, talked about the fact that he has a very long standing history in Northwest Arkansas, uh, married with family, with kids, no drug or alcohol issues, has had businesses, did turn himself in. We'll talk more about that when we get into the testimony that he has not been obstructive to the justice process, that he was not involved in other crimes. There's a caveat to that. And I will talk about it because previous allegations and juvenile allegations regarding his siblings did come up quite a lot. And we will be talking about that when we talk about the evidence part. The court did bring it up and say that it was concerning here. And that's talking about, as the prosecutors called it, and as I've called it before too, kind of the hands-on offenses, which literally mean hands-on as opposed to the uh, imagery offenses. So the court did talk about that and said that it did weigh um, against him in that nature, but that his longstanding history in the area did seem to, seem to indicate that he might not be a flight risk. And the court said that the court was deeply concerned about the children that he interacts with on a daily basis, including his own children. Now, the court did make a note of this later saying, but there are substantial rights of parents and trying to weigh the, you know, the rights of a parent and the concerns of the court was something that the court had struggled with. The court really did talk about the ages of Duggar's sisters with regard to prior allegations and that this was a problem. The court then went into the nature and seriousness of the danger that the person presents to the community. The court, I thought, was surprisingly candid, and it was refreshing for me, and said, look, I don't know. I, I am very concerned, but I simply do not know how much of a danger you present to the community because you've never been convicted of harming anyone. And the court made that very clear that this was a struggle and that the court was trying to balance the I don't know of it against the defendant's own constitutional rights, which really is the role of the court to balance those two things. The court was concerned about Duggar's own children, about their 
his own brothers and sisters, about his siblings' children, um, but also that there were these no convictions for harming anyone. The court said it was a close call. And then the court went into talking directly to Duggar saying, do not prove me wrong on this. There will not be a second chance. I am going to grant you bond, which means you will be out of custody with the least restrictive conditions appropriate. And in that, the least restrictive conditions appropriate are still fairly restrictive bond conditions for a federal case for somebody with no prior record. And given that, the court went on to list all of the conditions of release, which includes not being able to live at home. The court said that she did not think that Duggar was a substantial flight risk, but said that he cannot travel. He cannot travel. He cannot live at home. He is turning over his passport and he cannot leave the district, which means the district of Northwest Arkansas, where this is, there's three counties in the district that the court listed. And he is really on home confinement with the third party who is going to be uh, his custodian, essentially. So the third party custodian and the third party custodian's husband were both interviewed by the court. And we will talk about that. There will be GPS monitoring at cost to him. The court made it very clear that you are paying for your own monitoring. If you're not going to be in jail, we are going to monitor your GPS whereabouts. That it's home confinement. So this is essentially house arrest with GPS monitoring and can leave the home for employment, religious services, uh, medical appointments, attorney meetings, court obligations, and probation obligations, and any probation approved activities. The court said, this means you must have permission, not grace. And I thought it was a great way to put it, something that you would never hear said in California in court. But it was, you have to have explicit permission from the the probation department, if you are going to do anything that is not religious services, medical appointments, uh, and those things. And even if there are those things, they have to be within the confines of the district, which is just that three county radius, and the GPS uh, monitoring will be on. That uh, must not must not possess any type of, of porn or erotica of any type, must not have any access to tech. So not possess or access or utilize internet capable devices, including, and the court listed just about everything I think she could think of that could be connected to the internet, smart TVs, phones, tablets, gaming consoles, anything that can connect to the internet, you don't have internet connectivity. The court said you can go to Walmart. I think the court said Walmart, it could have been CVS, but the court said you can go get a jitterbug phone you can take it to probation to have them check it and approve it. You can use it to make phone calls. You cannot be connected to the internet. That is all. So living with a third party custodian, GPS monitoring, home confinement, telephone access, yes. Internet access, no. Um, what else was on there? No contact with minors at all, except for for their own children. So the Duggar's own children with their mother present at all times. And that was very clear, not your siblings, not your siblings, children, not a, you know, party, not a restaurant, not a, any, no contact of other minors. And the court was like, you really need to strongly consider being at home and then only being where you are supposed to be so that you are not around minors at all. Because if there is any contact with minors, it's a violation of this. And a violation means essentially you forfeit your bond, your bail, and can go into custody and will stay in custody until the trial on this case. Um, no controlled substance, no excessive alcohol abuse. You see that condition on every federal release. We saw them in the Jen Shaw case too. No firearms in the residence at any time, not surprising and pretty standard term, cannot violate any law. Also a standard term, DNA samples must be turned over and the um, appear as directed and sign an appearance bond. They didn't say how much the appearance bond would be for, but we'll see that in the paperwork when that gets filed with the court. Uh, that could take a couple of days for that to be on file with the court. But those are the terms of release. The court did say that these were um, onerous terms of release, asked the defense if they had any objections. The defense didn't say that they had any objections. 
the court made very clear that a violation ends up with you forfeiting everything, being immediately arrested or having a warrant issued for your arrest and being imprisoned. Plus, there can be additional charges, additional imprisonment, and what have you. Um, the court asked if the government, the people, the AUSAs had any any objections. The AUSAs, of course, said, we believe detention is appropriate. The AUSAs also said that they had been trying and having difficulty getting the Duggar children forensically examined. That's something that we as law nerds have had conversations about on social media. Um, and I know that part of the government's concern just I don't know. I speculate that part of the government's concern here is with him released, there's even more weight um, on the family that will make it harder to get the government, to get the Duggars to allow the children to be forensically examined by the government. So that is always a concern when there's children in the home, when there's charges like this. But that is something that they are trying to do. And that was a concern of theirs with regard to the release, um, was trying to have trying to have those children forensically examined just to make sure there isn't anything that is not known to the government at this time. The court said that essentially due process requires um, this release. And one of the big factors for the court weighing parental rights was like, look, since the time that the car lot was raided by Homeland Security in 2019, there's been some 19 months that have passed and he's been living with his children for the past 19 months. And the lead agent on the case was asked by the defense, you know, did you find Duggar to be an immediate threat to the community? And he was like, no. And he said, if you did find him to be a threat to the community at that time, would he have been arrested then? And the government um, investigator from Homeland Security said, yes, we would have arrested him then. And that was really the defense's main argument was, look, if Homeland Security was so worried that he needed to be in custody because he's a threat to the community. They would have and should have done it 19 months ago after this raid. They didn't do it then, so there's no need to do it now when there are other restrictive means available, including that third-party uh, custodian and the GPS monitoring and the court's rulings, because if you violate any of those, into custody you go. And that is really the breakdown of what the court ruled. So... So before we move on to what the testimony was, I am going to give a very strong warning. Um, I love you. I want you to be here. Do the YouTube things if you want. I am a legal commentator. I break down all the legal shit across mostly pop culture, but all kinds of pop culture. But the, we, we are going to talk about the way these things happen. And if you don't want to know about how people do this on the dark web. If you don't want to hear about the types of images that were recovered, the amount of images that were recovered, you are welcome. I look, I love having you here, but you are welcome to say, this is not for me right now. Uh, you can come back. I will timestamp it for you. We are going to be talking not super graphically. It was graphic. It was definitely graphic in this hearing. I am not going to be that graphic. Y'all aren't jurors on this case. You don't need to be traumatized. There are times people are like, what's the craziest thing you saw as a DA? I'm like, how much money do you have for therapy? Because I've had a lot of it, and I'm still not telling you some of the most traumatizing cases that I've seen because you didn't sign up for that, and I'm not going to trauma dump on you. I also realize that there may be many of you in the chat who have had circumstances of your own that, have, that are in the realm of sexual assault, sexual abuse, dealing with people who've had pornography addictions. I know you all want to share, but it can be hard for others who get triggered by that in the chat. So please just be mindful um, about sharing your own experiences with some of these things, because we are not going to try to pile on to everyone. We are trying to just break down the law mindfully, but these are darker parts of our society and darker parts of our our world that we don't always talk about and we're ju we're just talk we're talking about it today. We're going to talk about it. I am going to do my best to not just dump all of it on you, but we are going to talk we are going to talk we are going to talk about it. So, let's talk about this investigation cuz the 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 prosecution sure did put it all out there. Oh, they sure did. They sure did put it all out there. So, 
I'm making a note to timestamp this. All right. So detention hearing. The government presented evidence to go to the factors that we talked about in the court's ruling, which include the nature and circumstance of the case and the weight of the evidence against the defendant. And the people were like, okay, if you want to have a full detention hearing, we are going to have a full detention hearing. We are going to call our special agent and we are going to talk about what was found, how it was done, and how we know that it's him. One of the things with computer crimes that is going to be the defense position in this case too is that how do you prove who was sitting at the keyboard? Who was at the keyboard? Who was sitting at the other side of the computer when this happened? Because again, this is receiving images and having images. That's what this charge is or the two charges are. So how do you prove not just what was on a computer, but then who was accessing the computer. And that is part of what the government showed in this when talking about um, the evidence in this case. So the first um, person to testify was the special agent from Homeland Security who has been assigned to the federal child exploitation um division of Homeland Security since 2010 and works particularly in the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, which they call the ICAC, C-A-C, Task Force, which investigates um, CP, the production, distribution, possession of images regarding, you know, and distributed over the Internet, has worked over a thousand child exploitation cases, particularly in the area of CP crimes with regard to um, images of child sexual abuse. Familiar with this case, began investigating this case in May 2019. This case, and I had speculated about this in my live stream where I broke down the indictment, that this was either monitoring a website or monitoring, and this got caught in monitoring. The internet is monitored, folks, for certain things. <laughs> Uh, CP being one of those things. Sometimes I laugh when I'm uncomfortable. You're going to get to see all of it tonight. Um, because part of me doesn't want to teach people how to do this shit when we talk about it, but part of me wants people to understand how this happens because understanding how prosecutions work is important. So there are hash files within images and videos, and those hash files can be specific. So if an image is shared and shared and shared and shared, that hash information can stay and often stays the same. So even if the name of the file is changed, the hash information is the same. So law enforcement can monitor the web for these hash files to see if they are being downloaded. If the internet downloads a hash file, um, if it is being monitored, then the law enforcement agency will also download, oh, this computer at this IP address in my jurisdiction downloaded this, I am downloading this. And they will download it and preserve it as evidence and then open an investigation going, oh, th that's what that is. Open up the image. That's what that is. Now we need to get some search warrants. And then you get the search warrants on the IP addresses and start your investigation from there. So this was started with a local detective in Arkansas who did exactly that. They were part of uh, this ICAC task force, but not the Homeland Security's one. They're like a partner detective working a child exploitation task force in their area for their local law enforcement department. And that detective downloaded two specific files. These two specific files are the ones they talked about, but some of these files contain lots and lots of images and movies. The detective broke down for the court in detail what one of these movies was. Um, the two girls involved in the movie, there was also a third party male. Um, the images involved seven to nine year old girls. They involved child sexual abuse imagery. They were a movie. It was the whole thing. I'm not describing that anymore. The, the detective described it in detail. The second file contained over 65 images consistent with um, CP and 
were again, children in the age range of seven to nine years old, but that was not all of them. There were others found on the computer and we'll get into that in a minute. And they described in detail what those images contained because the court needs to be aware of the nature of the imagery and that the imagery is in fact the thing that it says that it is. And I hope, because I know people are interested, members of the public, and want to be present for hearings like this. I don't know if everybody who was going to do that was maybe mentally and emotionally prepared for an investigator that works in these task force to actually describe what these images are. Um, And I imagine for some, this might have been an unwelcome, uh, overly descriptive moment in court. I get that. But the judge has to know because, again, it goes to those factors of detention, the weight of the evidence and the nature of the crime. So how we get how we get to here, the detective, the hash files are tagged on by the program that does the things with the hash files, downloads them, opens them, is like, holy shit, that's what that is, finds the IP address, serves search warrants regards to the IP address, finds who the service provider is, is like, hey, service provider, who who's got this IP address? Here's our search warrant. The, uh, the internet service provider was like, well, this is Josh Duggar's account and this is the address. Turns out they gave them the wrong address. So they had to go back and get another search warrant. This will come up with the defense later going, well, you didn't even have the right address at first. Not our purposes, not a suppression hearing, not an evidentiary hearing. I'll talk about those in my thoughts about what the defense position on this case will be. So then they went back to the internet service provider and was like, yo, uh, that's not where Duggar is. And that's how they got to the car lot. The internet service provider was like, oh yeah, our bad. Um, Our shit's old. And this is the address where this account is, where that IP address is routing to. The IP address being the identifier of your digital stuff. So they got a federal search warrant for the property and then served a search warrant at the car lot described the car lot, described what happened in the execution of the federal search warrant, described that they showed up in plain clothes. They did not identify that they were a task force. Their clothes either said Homeland Security or police. I know people are like, why does Homeland Security have these task forces? Because they have the personnel and the money to do it. That search warrant was executed November 8th, 2019. They informed Duggar that he was not under arrest. It was just a search warrant. They were executing the warrant and they interviewed him at that time. Uh, Duggar said he wanted to call his lawyer. This is going to come up later. He wanted to call his lawyer and they're like, we appreciate that that's what you think you want to do. However, we need to confiscate your phone. This is not uncommon in digital crimes. Why? This is Emily experience that we're chatting about because smart digital criminals can have kill switches on their devices where they can remotely try to delete things. Um, They can also access their devices and try to delete things. So once they're on property, their goal is to compensate all of the devices that are connected to the internet, including the iPhone. They seized uh, an HP all-in-one computer, a MacBook laptop, and a iPhone. They talk about the fact that with the forensic evaluation, they also got into an old backup of a previous iPhone that had information in it that they made use of. We'll get to how they made use of it in a moment. They shared exhibits. Uh, There were four exhibits from the government. Two of them were photographs. One of them was the HP all-in-one computer. The desktop was an image of Duggar and his family. The government for privacy Uh, put a box around him and his kids. I am sure that that is a photo that is probably already out in the public sphere anyway. And if it is, some publication is going to be like, this is the photo that was blacked out in court. But it's to show in this case that the desktop of the computer is him and his family. It's like, look, if this isn't your computer, why is your happy face on it? So that goes to the HP. These items were found on that HP computer. When they talk about the HP computer and the, um, we'll get to the forensic evaluation in a minute. They talked about the interview. When they sat down to interview him, they sat down and said, um, we're going to interview you. Do you know why we're interviewing? And they relayed that Duggar said to investigators at that time, before they even got into it, 
before they even start recording it, before they read in Miranda rights, before anything, we're going to be interviewing you. He said to them, quote, what is this about? Has someone been downloading child pornography? Well, law enforcement agents are going to be like, um, well, that's a weird thing to say. Cause at a car lot, if the assumption would be from law enforcement, if you didn't know, why aren't you assuming we're thinking money laundering or something? Like, why is your assumption CP? And that is going to be part of the government's case. Look, he knew what they were there for because he knew what he was doing. That's going to be their argument. But that's what they said. He said this was prior to him being Mirandized. Whether those statements will come in down the road, there will be hearings about, I am sure. Um, particularly given the fact that he said he wanted to call his attorney and they're like, yoink, you, we are taking your phone. So sorry. That's evidence now. So they asked about the ownership. He said he owned the computers, uh, that he owned the MacBook Pro or the MacBook, that they were password protected. They were like, oh, cool. Can we have your password? He's like, no, no, we're not going to go ahead and give you the passwords, which is his right to do at that time. Uh, they get into those things anyway. It just takes them longer. He was asked if he knew what peer-to-peer -peer file sharing was, um, if he knew what some of these things were. And he's like, yes, I know, but I don't want to provide any more information according to what the investigator said in the hearing. They then talked about this Tor browser. <clears throat> I, again, I don't want to make anyone criminals up in here. Look, y'all, this is information so you understand how this shit works. This is not information for you to take and use for nefarious purpose. If you're curious about how cyber crimes work, I really like the book Ghost in the Wires by Kevin Mitnick. Um, it's early day hacking, and there's also a series on Audible called The Dark Web. Look, it's called The Dark Web for a reason. That shit's dark, but there is a great audible original series called the dark web that talks about how these crimes are investigated, talks about how they are perpetrated and talks about the things in the corners of the dark web. I'm going to touch on it briefly because it goes to whether he knew that this was happening or if someone else was at the computer, which some other dude did it is always one of the defense options. Um, back, back way back in the day when I was doing like misdemeanor drug cases, it was always, yeah, but officer, these aren't my pants. And it's like, they're on you though. Like you're wearing the pants, but the, everybody, everybody, they're not my pants. And that's the same in these kind of cases. They're not my computer. Somebody else is on the, it is my computer. Somebody else is on the computer. And that's going to be the thing here. So the Tor browser is a dark web, dark net browser. It is separate from BitTorrent programs. I'm not going to get into all the minutia of that, but it is well known to be used for this kind of behavior and for downloading CSAI images. That is what you use a Tor browser for. I mean, unless you're like trafficking in organs and, um, I don't know, personal identifying information profiles, but it's, it's used for dark web activity. Um, and they were asking Duggar in this interview about that. And he was like, I'm not going to tell you what I know about that. Right. Not, I don't know about that, but I'm not telling you what I know about that, which also is investigatively significant. At that point, they summarized the investigation to date for him and asked if somebody was sharing the computer. And um, yeah, they, they didn't get any information from him about whether somebody else was sharing the computer. They told him that a lot of the miners were five to 10 years of age in the images that they were dealing with. Um, and they said, look, we're talking about children five to 10 years old. Is there anything that you've seen or that you know to help us in our investigation? His answer was, I'd rather not answer that question. So there was definitely not a, uh, holy fucking shit. What? That's a, what are you talking about? That's not what happened in this interview, according to the investigator's statement at this hearing today. Then everything went off for forensic evaluation. It was forensically evaluated twice. Everything is, before it's evaluated, everything is um, mirror imaged, not mirror image, but, you know, data imaged and what have you. And then they do the forensic evaluation. 
What they found in the forensic evaluation, not getting into just the images, was very interesting to me. They found that the computer, the HP, had a Linux partition. For all of my tech tubers, y'all know what a Linux partition is. But here's what's interesting to me. Apparently, Duggar had something on his computer that I had not heard of um, called Covenant Eyes, which is a program that involves having a having a buddy, if you will, having a, a accountability partner to help you here. Let's just pull up their website. I'm going to show you. I was fascinated by this. Um, and it's one of the least dark things of this entire investigation. So of all the things, of anything I can show you, they talked about this website. They did not show this website in court. They referred to it multiple times. So I'm just going to pull it up and show you what it is because I had not heard of it. Um, and I was just like, wait, what is it? So yeah. Um, it's for people with porn addictions and um, it, it monitors your computer and then it will send any of your and all of your computer activity to your accountability buddy. So it is, it is to, um, it is to defeat porn together, uh, break bad habits for good life changing conversations, partner up to defeat porn screen accountability. So it records everything you do on your computer and reports it back to your accountability butter, butter, buddy, your accountability buddy. Um, secure, private, comprehensive. Yeah. Porn's the villain. Defeat it with covenant eyes. So they're always watching you like those lying eyes. They're always watching you. I'm not making light for any other reason that I am uncomfortable. And this was the most fascinating part. Well, no, there were other things that were fascinating. This is the lightest, most fascinating part. So this was installed on the computer and the account was registered to Josh and Anna Duggar. So it was presumed by the people that Anna Duggar was the accountability partner, that the internet behavior would be sent to like the screenshots of everything you were doing on the internet. However, when the government spoke to the people at Covenant Eyes because they got a search warrant and got the account information, there were no logs of any behavior from the HP computer. Why, you may ask? Well, maybe nobody was doing anything. Or it's because Covenant Eyes will not work on a Linux partition. So, so what it seemed to be is that the Linux partition completely defeats this program that's supposed to help monitor and hold you accountable to your behavior. But if you just set up the partition and do all the shit on the partition side, because partitioning your computer, I know that I'm, I've lost half of you. I've partitioned my computers, not anymore, but when I was a DA, I partitioned computers, particularly when I had to look at work stuff on a personal computer, I partitioned it so I wouldn't catch anything from anything. I never trusted work shit. And sometimes I needed to do it for programs. If I had a Mac computer and I needed to install windows on it, you can partition it. So it's like it's entire other computer in your computer. So it's like two computers in one essentially. And that partitioned part was Linux partitioned. So nothing that was done on the Linux partition would have been recorded by this covenant eyes program. And it was password protected. And the government found the password and then found that this password that ended in Duggar's birth date was the password that was used on his bank account, his utility account, his social media account, and the family social media account and used at the Family Research Council. So what they said was, look, the partition has a password. And the password for the partition is the same password that Josh Duggar uses for banking accounts, utility accounts, Duggar family, social media accounts. This is how the government starts to build their case going, who else is accessing it? Because you've got a porn accountability program with your wife. So it's not probably her. And it's not going to be your employees because you're not going to give them the password you use for your bank account. So... Who's using the partition part of the computer with the password? And if you wondered how government agencies make cases like this, they unearth your entire life, which is why these things take time, because they are tracking down every password you've ever used 
across everything to go, this is the same password as this and this and this and this and this. And if this ever went to a jury, they would say to the jurors, you know how we know it's his partition? Well, he uses this password here and on this utility account and on this social media account and on this account and this account and this account and this account. And who else's password is it? That's how they would do that. I mean, not with the faces. Government prosecutors are very much more serious than, than whatever that face was. So they, um, they then provided two exhibits that were forensic exam summaries. The forensic exam summaries were detailed, which means, I mean, these forensic exams are probably hundreds of pages long, if not more. But what they showed to the court in the forensic exam summaries were that Josh Duggar was accessing his phone. The phone would, if he took a picture, the picture geotagged at the car lot, but then close in time, he was accessing, or the computer in the office, the HP computer was accessing or downloading these images, but he's, they showed text messages of him texting, hey, stuck at the car lot or stuck at work or whatever it was, um, because you can't record these things. So it it's in that realm of stuck at work, stuck at the car lot, still here. So he's, they're showing his text messages and his geotagged uh, photos saying, look, at this time, and these times are made up, but at like 1105 screenshot or photo of car geotag here, 11, you know, 20 access to the computer. And they did that timeline showing his text messages, his geotagged photos, and the accessing of these um, CSAI images on that computer and the downloads of the images. The court took a break as they were publishing these exhibits. Publishing means showing them on the screen in the Zoom call to everyone, to the court, to the defense attorney, to everyone watching, and to Duggar himself. And the court went through, when they broke for this, reminding everyone no screenshots, no memorializing this, like no transcribing it, none of that. So when I say it's like this, it's because it's from memory. And while I have rough notes of the flow of the thing, it has not been recreated or memorialized in any way. That was the actual word the court used. No memorializing it in any way. No screenshotting it. So they had things like iChat messages and stuff. Um, they then went through what the computer was doing and said, look, there were like tour websites bookmarked. And then there were these other files access. The files all had uh, fairly graphic names. The, uh, the investigator was like, your honor, I'd rather not read them into the record. The court was like, I understand the names are graphic. And then talked about a particular uh, DD torrent file that was in the recent downloads. So when they did the whole forensic exam, they went into the recent accessed and the recent downloads and they found files that had been uh, downloaded, unzipped and deleted. The DD file is called Daisy's Destruction. This is a well known, oh, you guys, this shit's so dark. This is a well known series of CP and CSAI images. The images are children 18 months to 12 years old. See, I hated this shit when I worked and I hate this shit still. Um, the investigator testified that out of the thousands of cases that they had done, this grouping of images are in the top five worst images that this agent has ever had to examine. And that that particular file containing not just a image, but a series of images and videos was uh, downloaded more than once. So when we're talking about the amount of images here, we are talking upwards of a hundred images. And when, uh, pardon me, upwards of 200 images that were located in the unallocated space of the computer, the unallocated space is where you get these kind of ghosted images of things that were deleted, but they're not deleted because they weren't deleted. So, um, when we're talking about, and it's hard to talk about levels of this stuff 
when we're not talking to other members of law enforcement, because amongst DAs, you can talk about the levels of things because there's like, there's, there's levels of how bad this is. Yes, it's all bad, but there's levels of bad, kind of like the levels of, of hell. When you get a seasoned investigator who has worked on a specialized task force for over 11 years in this, and they say that these are the, this is one of the top five series of images that are the worst they have ever seen. It's the fucking worst. When I say it's the fucking worst, it's because it is the fucking worst of the worst, which is bad. Moving on from that, um, what was interesting in this investigation is that the investigator said that the, there were two forensic reports completed. One of them was completed by the Department of Justice and that the last forensic report was gotten back to the investigator February, 2021. So I know that a lot of people have asked why in the fuck did this take so long? The last forensic report came back in 20 February, 2021. So when we talk about putting the person who's doing the thing at the keyboard it's not just doing the forensic exam on the computer. It's the massive amount of search warrants that are being written. A, you've got to have enough evidence to get a search warrant. Once you get a search warrant, you have to send the search warrant. And then you're sending search warrants during COVID, which means it's going to take time to get the search warrants back because COVID, because people aren't working the way they were working. So you're sending out search warrants to everything because that's the way you're able to say, this image was geotagged here from this iPhone. Um, this password's the same as the bank password, the same as the uh, password for the utilities. All of those are search warrants that have to be written, served, followed up on, and then turned back over. Search warrants can take months to get the return on, to get the information back on. And then the search warrant has to be evaluated and examined by investigators who are working numerous cases. So I was not surprised to hear that the last forensic report from the DOJ came back in February 2021 because to prove who's at the keyboard, you need all of the shit that we've talked about. And all of the shit that we've talked about um, is, is, again, is ex what you would expect from a federal investigation. It's an overwhelming amount of evidence. Again, I am going to pause to say there is a presumption of innocence on every case. However, there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that was presented today. Oh, it binged. I have a Bing image, but this is a really dark topic, and I'm going to play it for a palate cleanser later. Um, and so some of this evidence, if there are issues with any of these search warrants, if there are issues with the fact that Duggar said, I want to call my attorney, and they took his phone away, some of these things that we are talking about may not be able to come into evidence down the road. There will be an evidentiary hearing about these saying, well, that statement was taken before Miranda rights were read and after his phone were taken, after he said he wanted to call his lawyer, and they will fight about these things to try to have some of these things excluded. We have the benefit of everything coming in. It might not all be proper legal evidence at this point. This was not an evidentiary hearing. And the standard for admitting evidence at a detention hearing is really, really low. 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 So even though the defense can object, they really can't object because there's no foundation really required. So you kind of get everything in. So the court gets the weight of it. Um, but there may be evidentiary hearings on some of this stuff later, particularly with regard to the beginning of the investigation. But I'll get into that in a minute. There was an extensive, when I say extensive, I mean extensive cross-examination by the defense uh, getting into whether the initial underlying officer had a warrant as they were tracking the hash files. That will come up in a evidentiary hearing or a suppression hearing down the road, I am sure. They got into the very much the fact that um, Duggar was cooperative that he turned himself in and the off the investigating officer was like, well, yeah, I mean, he turned himself in, in that his wife drove him. And we got a bit more information about this because what the investigating officer said was, well, the, 
AUSAs, the government prosecutors, government, the government called the lawyer, I'm presuming the lawyer that was asking the question, so there were three there for Duggar, could have been a different one, and said, hi, um, we'd like to not come into your house with armed Homeland Security officers because we know that there are children present. But we are outside of your home. You are going to jail. You can choose to drive yourself there and we'll arrest you there, or we will come into your home and arrest you in front of your children. And between the attorneys, it was agreed that his wife would drive him to the detention to jail and where he would be booked and put in. So they're like, I mean, yes, technically he drove himself there, but this was an agreement after the government called and said federal agents are outside to arrest you so we can do this the easy way or we can do this the traumatizing your kids way. We'd sure like to not traumatize your children any more than maybe they need to be traumatized because they are your children. So could we just not, we'd like to not traumatize the kids. And I thought it was very interesting hearing the reasoning that um, he was given the opportunity to drive himself into custody and the fact that there were agents outside saying, uh, we'll just follow you there then because we don't want to like bust down your door with kids inside. So there was that. Um, which makes sense given that the initial search took place in 2019 and we are now sitting in 2021. They asked a lot on cross about whether he was compliant and polite, whether he was aware of the nature and the investigation. And after 2019, he was aware that this is what he was being investigated for because they said that that's what he was being investigated for at the end. So the defense was really trying to set up these factors and then asked, if you believed that he posed an immediate threat, wouldn't you have just arrested him then? And I think that that is one of the factors that swayed the court with, yes, if he was an immediate threat to his community, his own children, to others, wouldn't they have just arrested him in 2019? And the officer said, yes, if we thought he was an immediate threat, we would have arrested him then. However, they wouldn't have had all the forensic evidence back and they could have arrested him then. They would have to let him go because they wouldn't have been ready to charge him because they wouldn't have done the grand jury yet. They wouldn't have had an indictment yet. So they would have arrested him and then let him out anyway because they wouldn't have been able to charge him at the time. So they wouldn't have arrested him anyway. And the court is aware of that. That was witness one. Then they got into witness two, the probation officer who pro who prepared with their department the um, pretrial release document. They talked about the fact that this was a presumption case, meaning it's presumed you stay in custody unless you don't stay in custody, but we presume that you stay in custody. And then talked about the fact that this probation officer interviewed the proposed third party custodian, the other adult that is going to be in charge of Josh Duggar if he's released, which he now is being released to this third party. And they talked a lot about who the third party was, how they were familiar with Josh Duggar. These are very clearly friends of Jim Bob Duggar. It is a family that is friends with him, a family that knows him through church, um, a family that believes that they can minister to Josh Duggar while he's under their roof that has a home with no minor children in it, that doesn't have Wi-Fi per se. They got asked a lot about their internet. They hotspot their phones. It sounded like they lived on some substantial acreage. So that's something I knew nothing about until I moved to Tennessee. And people were like, oh no, if there are certain places where you have to get satellite internet. And I was like, wait, wait, what? There, there are places with no internet. I Okay. So they were talking about the fact that they hotspot from their phone if they need internet, and that is their internet, that all those devices are password protected. So the no internet can be achieved, that the no firearms can be achieved. These individuals were like, yes, we have firearms. Again, Arkansas, that's not a surprise to me, but that they are willing to turn those over to the custody of somebody else while he's in their home. Um, that there was some concern regarding the additional attention that this case would bring the invasion of privacy that would come with the fact that he is living with them. The, the, the government asked, you know, are you comfortable with that? Are you ready with that? There was definitely some hesitancy from the wife in this. Um, they asked if they knew the details of prior allegations against uh, Duggar with regard to his siblings. And the government like laid all of that out. And the reason it was allowed one, because this isn't a, 
hearing that has the same standards of evidence. Two, it came in to whether these um, the third party family knew the nature of the allegations that he admitted to with regard to the sexual abusive conduct with siblings. And they talked about the, the government was like, are you aware that when he was a minor, he admitted to sexual abuse and inappropriate touching with minors ages 11, 10, 9, and 5. Do you know that shit? That's not how they said it. But do you know that shit? Yes, he was a minor. And the defense, of course, was like, look, if there was ever a conviction of this, which there wasn't, it would have been sealed. It would have been expunged. There's not been a conviction here. Um, These are allegations. And the court was like, I understand that they're allegations, but also he admitted it. So it's fair to ask this family if they are aware if he is going to be detained at home under their roof. And that is how um, these prior, it's, they're not a conviction. So they're allegations, but he admitted it. So what do we call it? Prior instances of sexual assault. That's what we're going to call it prior instances of sexual assault on a minor, not a conviction, but an admission. And if that's good enough for the federal judge, it's going to be good enough for me. I'm just so used to saying these are allegations because there's not a conviction, but these are prior instances of sexual abuse with regard to his siblings. In the course of this hearing, they refer to that as hands-on and that is to distinguish it from the the child sexual abuse imagery that is charged in this case as CP. So if I refer to it in that way, that is why it's because those are the kind of the hands-on allegations versus the images and the visual images allegations. In the court's ruling, the court did say that the fact that the images uh, recovered from the computer in the forensic exam were of minors under the age of 12, particularly in that seven to nine age range, and that the hands-on admissions were in that same age range and that he has children in that age range, the court said that they were deeply concerned about that. And that's part of why um, the the monitoring, the third-party custodian, not living at home, not being alone with any minors, uh, no contact with any minors, and not being alone with even his own children. So that that's where those prior instances of conduct came up in that hearing. Um, when the defense did their cross-examination of that, they're like, right, but those allegations are 19 years ago. And he was a minor. And et cetera, et cetera. So the defense tried to prove that this third-party custodian was comfortable. The wife um, did not seem comfortable when she was, when she was, uh, evaluated, she just, my opinion just didn't. So, and I, I jumbled the wife and the, uh, probation officer apologies. At the end of the day, the probation officer's recommendation was that he remained detained. Then they brought in the husband and wife that would be the third party custodians and interviewed them. So, or examined them in testimony probation officer said remain detained. Then they went through all of the information with the proposed uh, third party custodians. And at one point the, um, they were asked why or how it came up that they were going to potentially have Josh Duggar there. The wife said she had never had a one-on-one conversation with him, that the husband was good friends with Jim Bob, that Jim Bob called and asked him over the weekend if they would do this, that they prayed on it together. And these are their words. This is what they said. This is what she said in her sworn testimony. And the government asked, is this loyalty or pressure? And she said, my husband has made the decision and I am here to support that decision. We are here to help this family and minister to him. We prayed on it and This is what's being done in God's grace. And the way that she phrased it about her husband caused the government attorney some concern. She was like, so is this not your decision? Um, She backtracked away from that and said, no, we've discussed this before, but you could tell that there was concern there because she's the one that will be home most of the time with him and that she seemed uncomfortable with it. At the end of the day, the court asked both of the husband and the wife directly, if there is a violation 
you have to call probation. You don't call Jim Bob. You don't call your church. She's like, if you are home and there's a violation, you don't call your husband. You call probation first. Do you understand that? And she was like, yes. And the court's like, will you do that? And she was like, yes, I've raised two children. I have a mind of my own. I understand what the violations are if you tell me what the terms are. And yes, I'll call probation first. And I think that satisfied the court in that um, the court was like, okay, I, I've exam I've asked the questions I have to ask. I've looked these people in the eye over Zoom and said, if there's a violation, will you call probation? And both of them said yes, because at the end of the day, if they don't, it's on them too, because this is a pretty big um undertaking for a third party. So the court really did ask some pretty pointed questions. And at the end of the day, based on the court's ruling, the court was like, they are doing this out of loyalty to Jim Bob Duggar, but they've also said that they will uphold their duties and that they will uphold them in the way that I have asked them to. The court said that they were very concerned by the weight of the evidence. And the, it was interesting because the court multiple times stopped and said, there's a presumption of evidence here or a presumption of innocence, but the overwhelming weight of the evidence is serious. This case is serious. Um, each, each side was, I'll get to the, back to the court in a minute. I'm sorry. I'm a little jumbled and scattered. It's hard stuff to talk about. Um, as particularly when I am not in work mode and have not been in work mode for some years, the witnesses were done at about 5 15 PM. This hearing started at 1 30 PM. The closing arguments from the government were essentially look this is an individual who's technologically savvy, has gone to great lengths to hide their behavior from everyone, including their spouse, and evading this Covenant Eyes program. They've partitioned a computer. They're using a Tor browser. They're using BitTorrents to do this file sharing. They are, um, there is a massive amount of evidence here. There are quite a lot of images, very serious images. They are a flight risk. The government's statement was something along the lines of, yes, uh, Josh Duggar was aware of this raid back in 2019, but until he was arrested, this was always a possibility. Like, well, maybe they'll, maybe they'll come back like bad boys, bad boys. What you going to do? It had that vibe to me when the government's like, this was a maybe, but now it's like an actually. Um, so this was always, we don't know if it's going to happen and shit got real. My paraphrasing shit got real. And because shit got real, that creates a flight risk that didn't exist in the whatever months from that November 2019 raid till today. Essentially, he's a flight risk because shit just got real. Um, when it came to the extent of the danger, they did talk about the fact that the, the prosecution used the word sexually attracted to minors multiple times. They talked about him having a um, admitted pornography addiction they talked about the extent of the hiding activity and they talked about the um, past hands-on offenses. Yes, those are the words that they used. And all of that was concerning. And the government said, look, we're worried that the parties that are, are agreeing to be the third party custodians of Josh Duggar aren't aware of what they are in for, that they are not quite clear on what all of this is. And that there's hesitancy sit there. And the fact that they are still hesitant makes us hesitant. They want to do this as a favor to Jim Bog, but they really don't know Josh and they don't know what they're getting into. And they don't know who they're ho having in their home, essentially. The defense argued that he's not a flight risk, that there's been 17 odd months since that raid that he hasn't fled, that he w has been cooperative. He's not a threat to the community. If law enforcement believed he was a threat, they would have arrested him there, not now. So when I said I'd come back to what the judge said, the judge had to stop herself multiple times and said, yes, I understand there's a presumption of innocent here, but that there were over 200 uh, images carries a lot of weight, that the majority of images were of prepubescent children carries a lot of weight. The fact that the investigator said these are some of the worst 
images that they have seen in over a thousand of these cases was deeply concerning to the court. Um, the fact that there was dark web activity, a partitioned computer on a Linux browser to all my tech YouTubers, you're like, yeah, that's not a thing. It's a thing for the average public and um, more sophisticated than most that children are vulnerable victims that the, 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 I hate to say consumption, but that the propagation and downloading and use of um, CSAI feeds the market for it. And that this, like people doing this perpetuates people doing this and the ability of people to do this and all of that weighed very heavily against him and her, uh, her perspective that the government undertook substantial lengths to corroborate the evidence. And that's the tying the pieces together. That's the who's at the keyboard of it all. And how do we prove who's at the keyboard? And the court really broke down the lengths that the prosecution went through and the investigators went through to say, this is how we know who was sitting at that computer. This is how why we believe no one else was at the car lot that day. This is why we know he was at the car lot because there's you know, these geotagged images plus the same password plus all of these other things and that that weighed heavily against him. But at the end of the day, the balancing of constitutional rights plus threat to the community um, was very a very close call. And that's why it's on GPS monitoring and all the things that we've previously talked about. It's a lot, you guys. It's It's a lot. It is really fucking serious. It is not good. Yes, it's only two charges. These two charges carry a substantial amount of prison time. But seeing the way that the government has tied this case together indicates to me that they have a very strong case. So let's talk about my perception about what is going to happen from here and my take from the prosecution side and the defense side, and then we'll get into questions. Everybody just, I've got water, but you know what? I'm not going to lie. I've also got White Claw. <laughs> That's coming up next. Emily thoughts. Let me time once. Let me time stamped it. All right. Emily thoughts. The investigation on this case was clearly thorough. There were multiple forensic examinations. When you get to the DOJ forensic examinations, it's going to be hard for the defense to fight the forensic examination because the shit that's on the computer is the shit that's on the computer. The defense's best argument is either you got that shit off the computer illegally, therefore you can't use it. Um, or, some other dude did it. I don't know how they're going to prove some other dude did it when they have the text messages and the geotag photos and stuff placing him there at that time. And that password is going to be really hard to work around because that is a password using his date of birth. No, they didn't give the entire password. Password using his date of birth that he's using for his bank. The password you use for the bank, you're generally not giving to anybody else. That's going to be very, very strong for the prosecution. I think that if I were the defense attorney after this, I would be looking for every evidentiary issue I could find. Um, were any of the warrants improper? Was anything, you know, was there a concern that he said, I want to talk to my attorney? And then they went ahead and interviewed him after his phone was taken. Did he say, I won't talk to you without an attorney? Did he say, I'm calling my attorney? Did he say, I want to have an attorney? Because, you know, those Miranda rights, you have the right to an attorney. Generally, if somebody says, I want to talk to my lawyer, the interview stops. The government's going to argue, well, he didn't say he wanted to talk to his attorney once the interview began. He said, I want to talk to my attorney when the search began. And by the time the search was over, he felt like chatting with the government. And the defense is going to be like, he said he was calling his attorney and you took his phone. We want that entire interview thrown out. So there are going to be evidentiary foundational fights with regards to warrants and lawyer lawyer talk fruit of the poisonous tree type of arguments fopped my lawyer friends my law school friends any of you that are not studying for finals at this moment because you want to hear about duggars fopped they're going to say look if the underlying investigator the first investigator the detective in arkansas didn't appropriately get those initial hash files that got the IP address, then everything that comes after is potentially fruit of the poisonous tree. So you can't have any of that evidence. You don't get to use it. You can't use like this piece of illegal evidence, but then it gets you all this other shit, but that shit was legal on a warrant. 
But if the first bit's not legal, it taints all the rest of it and you can't use it. So those are the types of evidentiary arguments that I think we'll see here. Do I think it'll fly? I don't know the extent of that initial investigation. We saw hints of it with the way the defense was doing their cross-examination. However, we also have a well-established task force and the underlying detective, the detective, the local agency detective is a um, associated party to this task force. They are not new at this. They did not just stumble across this. This is what they do. So if this is what they do, I am going with the probability that they did it properly, but the defense is going to have nothing to argue, but that the evidence was gotten wrong and trying to exclude as much of it as possible. If I am talking to my client tonight as a defense attorney, I am asking them, did you hear what the court said? Because what the court said is, this is serious. This is a lot of evidence. They went to extensive lengths to tie all this together. They did a good job tying this all together on and on and on. Would you like to have a conversation about resolving this matter? Or, hey, yes, there's all of this, but we think there's these evidentiary issues. So do, we know that the federal government comes out swinging. We know that they have the money to do investigations like this. We know that they will dig into your entire life to find this evidence. And that's what they've done here from the defense. They're going to go after the evidence, the evidence, the evidence, because if you can get some of that thrown out, you can limit the damage done and then try to resolve the case. Do I think they'll plead before they do evidentiary hearings based on the cross-examination here? Mm, I wouldn't be so confident that they would enter into those until they did that. I think they would do some of the evidentiary stuff first, but again, discovery hasn't even been turned over in this case. Like the defense still doesn't even have all the shit yet because it was just a custody hearing. Once the defense has all that, then they'll be able to reevaluate whether there are places to poke holes towards this evidence and try to get some of it thrown out. That is their job. That is what they do. No matter how gross the behavior is, no matter how much we fucking hate it and want to see people go to prison there are constitutional rights that have to be abided by, and that is the job of the defense attorney. So those are kind of my general thoughts. The prosecution has a strong case. They've done a really good job tying it together. This is really fucking dark. There are a lot of images. The children are very, very young. The defense is going to go after the evidence here. Fuck, that's a lot. Y'all. And I've been talking for an hour and 20 minutes, and there's over 10,000 of you here. Hi, everybody. We're going to get into questions. I'm going to try to answer as many super chats as I can. I don't know if I will get to all of them. I'm just going to say do the YouTube things. If you're new here, go ahead and subscribe. We're growing. Um, the sub counter clicked over. Now, it used to click over every hundred. Now, it only clicks over every thousand. So, you all haven't even seen this yet, but here's a palate cleanser. Get ready. We're going to do a palate cleanser. Um, Tech Valor, our lovely mod, made us a sub counter. Oh, it binged image. So let's just, we're going to do that now as a palate cleanser. And then we're going to get into questions because we all need a shower. Oh, it binged. Move your head. Ah! That's our new it binged. That's our new it binged image. Let me know in the chat what you think of it. I'm going to pull up some of the super chats and tried. I, I, I might not get to all of them. I apologize if I don't get to all of them. You guys, oh, this is just, this is really heavy, dark shit. When any of you wonder why DAs, well, me particularly, go to uh, therapy, it's because we deal with shit like this all the time. And it's hard. It's just hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard stuff. So I'm going to try to pull up some of these super chats and get to some of the ones that are questions. If you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them to the best of my ability. Please go ahead and just put question. You do not have to super chat to answer a question. I will try to get to as many as I can. Oh, it's hard. Oh, and there's a bunch of these, you guys. Thank you. Um, Let's go. Jennifer said, thank you, Emily, for being with us on yours and Dr. B's birthday week. You're welcome. I mean, we're so old. We've had lots of birthdays. Hopefully we'll have lots more and hope you all had a good time. It, this hearing ran really long. 
really long. Um, Tia Sabo said, thank you, Emily. Happy birthday to Dr. B. He is just, he is just so lovely. Sorry, we took you away from Dr. B tonight. Look, this was a family conversation with me and Dr. B about do we, um, do we go live? Do we not go live? Is it okay with you? We had that convert. We absolutely had that conversation. Uh, and he was like, no, we're totally cool with it. And I said, thanks, hon. He goes, you got to tell you, if you don't talk about it today, when are you going to talk about it tomorrow? And I said, I can't talk about it tomorrow. Tomorrow we've got a members only live. I mean, we'll probably talk about it more then, but we have a members only live tomorrow night. So we're not talking about then. And then Friday we have Friday night live and it, we're going to touch on it, but not this in depth because it's fucking dark. And so this will just be here. And if people want to subject themselves to it, they can. And if they don't, then they don't have to, but that's okay. Cause there's over 10,000 of us here just doing this. <sighs> One of my dearest friends works only in child abuse. So when we're on the phone, it's just like, how are you? And it's like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And I'm like, I get it. I get it. Because it's just, it's hard stuff. Uh, Raven said, thanks for staying up late and watching the hearing. It was a long hearing. Tell Dr. Badass, thanks. I will tell him. Emmy says, thank you. Uh, Francine, in honor of Dr. B's birthday, what a great couple, what a great family. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to get, I see a lot of these for sure. I'm going to try to get to the ones that are questions. Um, but I do see them. Miss Hinky says, I would, I say we've left code red. This is code black. I mean, this is, the thing is, this is dark stuff. It's not, it's not silly fuckery. This is not fuckery. This is just the criminal justice process working. And this is the dark side of not only the internet, but the dark side of humanity that we see when you prosecute stuff, which is why this um, weighs so heavy on prosecutors. Carolina said, wish me the best in my law school exams. Almost a 3L. Congratulations for being almost a 3L. Um, Ashley Claire said this was a slap in the face to the victims. I, I understand why it feels that way. I do. Um, and I understand why the court said it was a close call, but I also understand the defense saying, look, there was over 17 months when he knew what the charges were and he has not gotten in trouble. He has not run. He, I get it. Like I, I get where the court's coming from on the balancing of the constitutional rights and the, the threat to the community. I get why the court said it was close. And I get why the court said, look, with GPS monitoring and with a third party and with all these restrictions, I feel that this is something that we can work with. And if this does not work, you're going right back into custody. Um, Liz said, in cases like these, are the defendants usually allowed release? Yes. Um, like with the rules, but allowed to see their kids even when monitored? Yes. Yes. Um I think this decision might have been easier for the court had he not been high profile. I think in this case, he did not get out because he's high profile, that that actually could work against him. But the reason it works against him, because somebody else who had admitted things like this, it wouldn't be so known to the court. And it was known and past acts that were not convictions did come up, which is not something that would normally come up in a hearing like this. It would only be past convictions. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, question, if the court was so concerned about their, his behavior, why was he released in the first place? Kyla, the, when the court went through and weighed the different factors, I think one of the biggest things was the investigator saying, look, yes, if we thought he was a danger to this community, we would have arrested him 17, 19 months ago. And we didn't. And the defense attorney's like, right, they didn't. And nothing has happened. Now they haven't been able to forensically examine his own children. So nothing has happened that is known to the court and the court has to balance those rights and detention is the most restrictive means. So when, when we see conversations about bond or not bond, there's a lot of conversations about if you have enough money, like what if you don't have the money for GPS monitoring? Well, then you stay in. Well, is that equitable? I don't know, not always. And so then these conversations about, oh, so if you have money, you get out of custody. What if you didn't have anyone that was willing to take you in for six months to a year instead of you being in jail? Then what do you do? Well, then you sit in jail. So there are lots of conversations around the complexity of balancing the equities of bail and bond, but American, 
the American criminal justice system is overwhelmingly leaning towards people being out without paying a bond and being out of custody until trial. That is the the direction um, that people are pushing for this to go. So it's, oh, it's a lot. It's a lot, but it's a very, very good question. Um. Tiffa said over 7,500 watching. Oh, that was a while ago and 634 likes. You guys can like it. You're liking not the behavior. You're liking the coverage of the behavior. You can, you can do that. You can go ahead and like it. Um, Donald Duck said, so Anna and the Duggar family are in a cult. I mean, I've seen people call it that for sure. They are taught that if their partners are unfaithful, it's the wife's fault. I mean, that's my understanding. Also, you need to think, um, your uh bussers because they made it so God can use you. I oh thank your abusers. I think that is a that if that is the take, that is a rough take for me. But thank you, Octonation. Thank you for the super chats. Um, Pink Piggy, if you ever get picked for a jury and it ends up making you physically ill to listen to, could you end up leaving the jury? Um, you would be made aware of the allegations at the beginning for sure. Um Question, as a therapist that works with victims in cases like this, whose parent has charges like this, the court usually waits until the children have been examined to allow bail. Why not this time? Pam, the court didn't say. They didn't say why they didn't wait until um, until the kids have been examined. I suspect, and again, the court didn't say, I suspect it's because he will not be living in the home. Uh, but the government absolutely brought it up and was not happy about it. Uh, Eva Roberts said, there's something I always ask. Do y'all as lawyers have support for therapy after trials like these? No, we do it on our own. Personally, don't agree because of all that you mentioned. Um, not through work, not for the agencies I've worked for. That was all done on your own because people get nervous about going to therapy and having it then be reported back to their job. And there's complexity around that as well. Um, all right, I'm going to get to a few more of these so I can try to get to all of the questions. Um, question, will the mother's helper be interviewed? They've done quite a lot of interviews based on this and, um, and not all of that came in today for sure, but they've done a lot of interviews. They said they were still trying to do forensic interviews of the kids. So people who are around this family would absolutely have been interviewed, but we don't know who all of that was because this was a detention hearing. Uh, question, will the feds investigate this beyond Duggar, i.e. people taking, distributing any associates who may be involved participating? Uh, this is part of a larger task force. So they were monitoring these hash files. So I'm sure there's other prosecutions with regard to those hash files. So yes, this is part of a larger task force and this is all they do. Melanie, when do you think trial will begin? Uh, this could be six months or more, but the forensic exams are done. So once the defense gets the evidence, it will depend on how much time the defense needs to review the evidence, how many gigabytes or terabytes of data we're talking about from the computers, um, and then evidentiary hearings. So six months to a year would be reasonable on this, um, I think. So... Question, why only two charges? Because they do not charge per individual image because of the way that the federal crimes work. And I talked about that a bit in the video where I talk about the indictment. So one charge for receiving it and downloading it and one charge for actually having it. So that is that is why. Um, question, if a police officer has a warrant for a particular device, does the phone owner have to surrender the password? Is that violating your right to remain silent? It, <laughs> it, well, it depends. Generally, they do not have to surrender the password. The law enforcement has to go ahead and get that through their forensic exam. So they are not, there's conflicting case law depending on the jurisdiction. But generally, no, you do not have to give them your password, but it also depends on jurisdiction. That's a whole video. I should do a whole video. That's a whole video. Um, on, do you have to, um, question, will Anna get in trouble with signing over ownership and taxes? 
I don't know why I talk about the asset forfeiture provision in this case. When I break down the indictment, the asset forfeiture really goes to the stuff that they've already taken uh, the computer, the iPhone, stuff like that, that though you're not getting like, you're not getting the tech back question. Wouldn't the evidence about the text messages of him at the dealership be considered circumstantial evidence, the passwords as well. Uh, yes, it's all circumstantial evidence, but circumstantial evidence is just as strong as direct evidence. And there are jury instructions to that just because it's circumstantial doesn't mean it is not strong. The jury decides the weight of that evidence. So there are two types of evidence, direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is like, this is the jury instruction in California. If you walk outside in the rain and you get wet, that is direct evidence that it is raining. There's rain falling on your head. You are wet. But if you're inside the courthouse and people come in and they are shaking off umbrellas and they are taking off raincoats and flicking water everywhere, that's circumstantial evidence that it's in fact raining and they have come in. Um, could a whole bunch of people have been sprayed down by a hose? I mean, it's very unlikely, but it's circumstantial evidence. So that. Um, almost all of my lives are saved. I very rarely don't save lives unless there are tech glitches question. Is he allowed to see his kids? Yes. With his wife present. Will this end in a plea deal? Likely. Uh, but most federal cases do Eugene. Thank you. I was having a reaction to my second vaccine vaccine shot yesterday. I'm sorry. Your live streams helped me get through it. Hopefully it's not because they put you to sleep. No, I'm teasing. I know. I know that they put a lot of you to sleep. Um, because of the soothing nature of my voice, not this soothing content. This is not, this is, this is, just bleh. this is just dark, dark shit. Um, so you're welcome. I'm sorry you had a reaction to your second vaccine. I'm glad the live streams help. I mean, they're long enough. We're an audible book. Am I gonna be okay? I am. I get triggered by stuff. I have done some really, really dark, dark cases, and and some of that is still like pe li literally diagnosed PTSD that I still deal with. But yes, I do not talk about cases if I'm not going to be okay. Like if I look at something and I'm like, I cannot, A, I don't want to trauma dump on y'all. And B, if it's, if it's going to destabilize me, then I won't talk about it. But I also know myself pretty well after, you know, 15 years of a dealing with this and doing this, this was harder for me as a newer DA. And you know, there might be times when it's appropriate to talk about some of that stuff. I will never talk about everything that I've, I've uh, prosecuted or, or dealt with because uh, we don't need to traumatize everyone. I've talked about it with colleagues. There's stuff that I, Brian and I have not talked about um, just because there's stuff that people that choose that don't choose to work in the work that I did um, just don't need to know about kind of the darkest parts of humanity. But yes, thank you for asking, but yes. Um, question, if found not to fulfill their obligations, can the third party be held in contempt? There, there can definitely be issues. I have not pulled the statute, um, for it, but yeah, the contempt is one of the things there can be others. Question, if he attends church where there are minors, isn't that a problem? He cannot go to church if there will be minors present. So it's like, first, you must not be around minors. Second, you can do these things. Um, but if there will be minors at church, he cannot go to church. So, um, Madeline Poyer with a super chat said, speaking as someone who came from fundamentalist Christianity, wives are expected to submit to their husbands. Speculations wouldn't be surprised if the wife is not okay with it, but submitting, um, Madeline, that's the read I got from watching this zoom call that it was, it was not all right with her and the government attorneys were hitting on that saying, She's the one that's going to be home. Her husband works. She's the one that's going to be home with Josh Duggar and she's not okay. Um, but she told the court, I can make up my own mind. I can make my own decisions. I will call uh, probation if there's an issue and I'm okay with it. Like I, you know, you help someone in need and that's what we're doing. So it seemed, uh, it seemed to me that she was not okay. His kids should be, um, should be forensically interviewed. That just hasn't happened yet. So 
um, question, why was he let go so early? So Belisa Bella, he's not let go. He's out of custody pending trial with conditions of release and home detention. So he's on a very, um, a very structured house arrest. So it is arrest at home. Well, not his home. He's at a third party home instead of being in custody. Um, I'll have to pull the docket when it's up tomorrow. They did not state the next court date. It's going to be after there's going to be a briefing schedule that'll be up on the court date. I'll talk about it on Friday. So for sure. Um, question, do things like this make you parent different? Yes. Yes, they do. But I didn't have kids when I became a DA and I worked in a pretty intense unit as a law clerk. So I didn't really think I would parent differently than I do now because I've always, I went into parenting with this job, if that makes sense. Um, but I, people who aren't and haven't worked kind of law enforcement and law enforcement adjacent might not get all of the things that I do. But um, yeah, I'm very, very, very protective um, and highly suspicious. Natasha, question, how can they use he couldn't call his lawyer because they took his phone when clearly there is most definitely an office phone he could have used to call his lawyer from? It depends on how the rest of the search went down. I don't know if there is a physical phone in the office um, or a landline phone or if this is all on a cell phone. I mean, I don't have a landline phone. So I don't know that that is true, but it could be seen as the government denying him the right to talk to his lawyer. I'm sure they will argue it that way. I don't know if that will fly because you have the right to a lawyer. And generally, if you say, I want to talk to my lawyer, the, the government cannot question you further. The police can't be like, are you sure though? But don't you want to talk to us? But we're so nice. Just talk to us. Generally, once you say, I want to talk to a lawyer, any questioning stops, but questioning hadn't started yet when he made that statement. So it will, it will be a hearing. It will absolutely be an evidentiary hearing. Um, Sarah in the suburbs, this would come up in a forensic interview. The government said they are trying to do that, but the parents, the parent, the mother in this case has to cooperate to allow that to happen. And I very, very much hope that that happens. Can the court mandate his kids be interviewed? Um, it's hard because these charges do not involve his own children. The government is trying to do forensic exams of the kids. I hope that that will happen. Um, Taylor RS, I really need a shower. I understand. Me too. Um, Ty, same. Brit, question. Oh my, Miss Emily, how do you deal with these kinds of things without breaking down? I'm an abuse survivor and I don't understand humans. I don't always understand humans either. I've done a lot of therapy. Um, I know my own boundaries and I know when I need to take a step away. Um, I also know that whether we talk about this or not, that this happens. And so my hope in the cases I choose to talk about, my hope is that there, I don't just talk about a case because it may get views or y'all might want to see it. Yes. Whether y'all want to talk about it definitely plays into it. I try to pick cases where we can learn something together. We can learn about how court works, how trial works, how intellectual property works, how you can sell the trademark rights to your name, like Haley page, how lawyers can totally fuck over their clients like Tom Girardi, how money laundering works like is alleged in the Jen Shaw case or how the darker aspects of the dark web work, because whether we talk about it openly um, or not, it's going to still happen. And I hope we've had over 10,000 people on most of this stream that that is more than 10,000 people who are now aware that this is happening, aware how this is happening and are a little more savvy when not only it comes to propositioning for new laws to understanding why, you know, when I say things like I'm not always, I'm not always for getting rid of bail entirely. It's cases like this that I think of. It's not some dude who lives in a state where weed's still legal, which is dumb anyway, getting, you know, getting stuck into custody for a year before it goes to trial. That shit's stupid. But in cases like this, I'm like, no, no, I need your whole ass life to be on the line if you're going to be out of custody because it's a big deal. So 
I hope that it gives a context to the conversations we're having in America around criminal law, because criminal law involves a lot of things, including this, and understanding that this is part of what's going on that we don't always see. And even though we don't always see it, it doesn't mean it's not happening. So I hope to bring some um, understanding of the process, because I also saw a lot of frustration, like how and why was he let out? I'm like, well, there's rules and constitutional rights, and there's factors that the court has to consider, and this is how this happens and why. Um, thank you very much for the birthday wishes. I'm very excited. Robin, this is a great question. So in cases like this, they are peer-to-peer -to -peer torrent sharing. I made a joke in the last video where I said that that's what I suspected in this case. And I made a joke about like LimeWire, which used to be a torrent music file sharing back in the early 2000s, where things like LimeWire and Napster existed and people were peer-to-peer -peer sharing music. Mostly they were peer-to-peer -peer sharing like computer viruses, but you could share music files on these big like torrent sites where you could be like, oh, I want to hear the new whatever song it is and just download it. Or, ooh, I want to hear the live recording from this concert that I didn't go to. And it was peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. The dark web has that for these kind of images. Mm -hmm. So that happens on the dark web, uh, amongst other things. Will he be allowed to physically see his children? I went over that, yes, with his wife present only. Um... I'm going to try to get to a few of the super chats. Thank you all for them. I know I've missed some. And if I have missed some, um, I am sorry. Anna has six kids to watch at homeschool. Um, I'm, I'm sure she would. I look, it sounds to me like they, th so much speculation, but that this, the program, the covenant eyes program was supposed to be kind of the, the fix in all of this. So I imagine there is an overwhelming sense of betrayal that there is now a hearing about a partition that was going to get around that program that was supposed to help with this. So I imagine. Um, EK, we will see how much the bail is. He had to sign a bond. Um, hold on, let me pull up my notes. He had to sign an appearance bond. So I don't know if there is any uh, amount of monies that was not discussed. Um, soon, soon it's twinkle, twinkle time, Octo. Thank you. We've moved on to the white claw. So we have moved on. Um, Katie asks, what would be a good plea deal? Well, I mean, good for, for our perspective and good for the defense perspective is totally different, but the case carries a five-year minimum. So even if he walked into court and was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm guilty. Supposition. If you walked into court, your honor. Yep. It starts at five years and goes up from there. And then there would be a hearing like this. So, ah. Uh, Question, is there a risk that he could harm himself? One would always hope that that would not happen while somebody's out, but that's a risk in custody and out of custody. And it's very clear that there's not to be weapons in the house and he's to be monitored essentially 24 seven. So we will see. Will they catch people sending this stuff to him? So these are peer to peer access. So it's not, it's not sending per se, it's accessing and downloading. And that's what they do. Um, that's what they do. They, they look at where these things are coming from and trace them back. Sometimes VPNs make that hard. Sometimes the dark web makes that hard. The torrents, the BitTorrent and the Tor uh, browser make that hard, but they, they track it down. So they, this, these are task forces that do this and track the people who are receiving it and the people who are distributing it. Um, Camille, question just off what you said about this info helping for enacting change. So these CSAI images, do they tend to be from other countries or locally? I, uh, it, I don't know if you mean where they're produced or where they are housed. A lot of the dark web servers are not housed in the U.S. With regard to production, it is, it is a topic for another day. 
question, his family is politically active with connections. Several of his brothers own planes and have licenses to fly them. They're millionaires. How is he not a flight risk? That's because the court, not my decision to make. It's the court's decision to make. The court seems to believe that because there was knowledge of this investigation for well over 17 months and he has children and a wife and deep family ties to the community, that he is not a flight risk. If the court is proven wrong, the government will will track him down. We will see. That was the court's that was the court's belief and the court said it was close for them. So we will see. Um I'm going to answer just a few more and we will go from there. What is a Napster? Victoria This is a a question for the elder millennials and for Gen X. Napster, there were government hearings about Napster. Napster was a peer-to-peer file sharing website where people could download music in violation of copyright law. So it was like, hey, it was like being able to go over to your friend's house and give them a CD and they could rip it, but over the internet, but that shit's illegal. It got shut down. Um, Oh my God, I used to use LimeWire right back in the Disney. Uh, I know I'm going to miss some of these super chats. I'm sorry. Eva Roberts, don't know you from anyone, but I always enjoy education and it does need compensation. Well, thank you. Happy birthday. I still don't agree with the judge, but that is probably why I'm not a judge. And uh, five years, that's it. Well, thank you <laughs> for that, Eva. Look, it's it's not easy, but the judge has to follow the law even when the charges fucking suck and we hate them. That's what it means. Look, justice is blind. Lady Justice, where is Lady Justice? She's up here somewhere. Where did Lady Justice go? She's on one of these. Uh, where is she? She's down here. Lady Ju- Oh, you can't see her. I need to move her over. She's getting moved over. Lady Justice, this is a Lady Justice from my late grandfather that he gave me when I passed the bar. I'm going to move her into that corner. Next live stream, she'll be over there. Lady Justice wears a blindfold. The reason Lady Justice has a blindfold because justice is blind. The reason justice is blind is because the law is the law and it requires what it requires, regardless of things like how we feel about a particular defendant. All defendants should be treated the same, equal justice. And that means that the law has to be carried out even when it sucks. Justice is blind is very easy to say. It's very hard to internalize when we hate the result. Do I think that this judge's result was improper? No. Do I disagree? I think there are grounds to keep him in custody. But also, when you have the investigating officer saying, yes, if I thought that he was a significant um, risk to the community, we would have arrested him then, and that was 19 months ago, it's really hard for a judge to justify continued detention. And I get it, but I don't like it. But I get it question who is monitoring him. And I did not say their name out of respect of just the fact that they're probably going to get inundated with all of the the world's shit. Um, Friends of Jim Bob Duggars. So that's who. Um, uh, Question, Dark, thank you for for categorizing the type of question. Is there extra time and consequences if a person, oh, I don't know about that. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. The age, I know that there's age range breakdowns for it. I have never seen that breakdown. I've only seen age category breakdowns. So I don't know, but I am sorry that that is an experience that you are going through with your family. That is a lot. Um, I'm going to go over that on Friday because the court didn't identify next dates and I did not pull the docket after this hearing because it was so late in the day. It wasn't going to get updated today anyway. So, uh, Nicole, thanks for doing this. You're welcome. Someone was live updating Reddit and I was crying reading the case details. I hope nobody was live updating Reddit. Live updating this case was forbidden by the court. Um, I'm coming in late because I laid with my kiddo. Yeah, it's one of those hug your family kind of cases. It for sure is. It for sure is. But nobody should have been live updating the case. But people will do what they will do. The court email on this. I'm just going to read it to you real quick. Let me pull it back up. My email's closed for the night because I don't. Um, 
Where is it? Let me pull up with the court. The court, it was like highlighted and in red and said, um, in, in bold and in red, advisory not to record. This is a public court, and these video proceedings are available for public observation. However, highlighted in red and underlined, everyone participating in or observing the hearing is advised that no portion of these proceedings may be recorded or published in any form or fashion whatsoever. Recording of these proceedings by any meet is prohibited. See Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 53 and local rule violating this prohibit prohibition may result in sanctions, including being found in contempt of court in bold, in red, in, in a larger font, no social media should be accessed or utilized during the proceeding. Disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. Um, please keep devices on mute unless asked. So I took that as no live updating because that is a form of recording and the court was very annoyed by it. So I, that's how I took it. Uh, sending my love from me and my pawnards to everyone. Thank you, Trish. Welcome, Emily. As we are wrapping up, because I'm on my like fourth goodbye, um, and there are still 9,000 of you here, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and do that. I don't know if this is going to bing again, but if you're not subscribed, subscribe. Don't forget to hit the like. Somebody let me know how many likes we have on this video. We've had over 10,000 people all night, so there should be some likes. Let me know if there are. Um. Let me see. Is there any investigation into the welfare of the victims? So with regard to the images, sometimes the images are not actual children. They are digitally created lifelike. And those images are still illegal. I talked about that when I talked about the indictment. When law enforcement can track down the children who were used in the production of this. That is a whole separate thing with separate prosecutions um, that are not related to the person who received or viewed the images, but those are separate. Um, question, does the third party get paid for constant monitoring? I don't believe that they do, but the costs of the GPS monitoring are going to be borne by Duggar. This was a, hey, we'll take him, we're going to take him in. They The court it was either the court or the prosecutor. I don't remember which. Either the court or the prosecutor asked if Jim Bob had promised this fam the the husband and wife that were going to watch him, and they have adult children. One is in the house at twenty two, and the other one's out of the house. If they had been promised any benefit essentially for doing this, and they said no. Um. <sighs> mm. Miss Cassandra said, question, is it a coincidence that a day after Josh's arrest, a top website for this was taken down? Likely um, because he was raided in 2019. So possibly. Um, I answered this earlier, Helena. Yes. Y'all come on now. What? Y'all, come on. You're the greatest. Oh, it binged. Move your head. Ah! <laughs> We're talking about the darkest shit ever and it binged twice. Thank you for subscribing. We talk, we don't always talk Duggars here. We really don't. We talk all kinds of legal shit. And this is the way we talk about legal shit. Um, so pretty accountant are absolutely bringing up issues with race and the disproportion of race in the bail system. What's hard in the statistics is that they don't always differentiate socioeconomic and there are huge issues of, of wealth disparities. And those things do also divide along racial lines. So the bail system absolutely impacts POC. And that is, is a huge consideration in the bail system. And that's why when I said earlier, what if you can't afford, if you can't afford the ankle monitoring, then you can't get out on the ankle monitoring. And that's part of the overall discussion about bail in the U S is 
when is bail equally applied if you can't afford if you can't afford to do these things live with a third party not live at home generally not work um be on an ankle monitor then what do you do and those are are discussions that absolutely impact marginalized communities in a much different way than other communities it's all a part of it so thank you for bringing for bringing that up as well um and I don't have all the studies on that, which is why I don't always talk about it because I don't have all of the data at my fingertips to say, and these are how that breaks down, if that makes sense. Why is Anna considered a safe guardian? Um, I don't know. Doesn't her letting him see the kids make her unfit? No, because the court's saying that he can. And that's what the court decided. So we will see. Um, I'm going to get to just a few more questions and then we are wrapping up. Thank you guys for subscribing, for being here, for asking questions, um, for all of it. And I, I appreciate that. I know I didn't get to all of the questions. I, tr I really did try to get to all of them. I know that I missed some of the super chats. I apologize. Thank you all for subscribing to the channel. Thank you all for absolutely, um, for joining as members. Beth, is there a way he could plead deal with info on other people? Normally that happens much earlier in investigation than this. Um, but the charge zero carries a five year minimum. So any arrangement with the government still carries a five year minimum. So I don't know if that's something that is, I, yes, it's always possible, but it doesn't get around the five year minimum. Welcome faith Roberts. You're welcome for the palate cleanser tomorrow night. Look for the channel members tomorrow night. We're doing much lighter stuff. We're going to react live to my first ever YouTube video from almost six years ago. We're going to talk about Jeff Wittick. We're, we'll probably talk about Gabby Hanna blaming ADD for everything. I am ADHD and dyslexic. So I have feelings. We're going to do, we're going to drink and we're going to laugh. We're going to do all of this. We're going to do all of that later. Tonight was very, very heavy. So Welcome. Oh, you're new. What does it ding mean? It's when we add new subscribers. This is the subscribe counter. And um, it turns over at every thousand subs now. And it binged twice tonight, which fucking blows my mind. Um, so there we are. We hit 100,000 subscribers on Monday. It's Wednesday and we're at 103,000. What? Uh, did any of his siblings attend the hearing? So I looked through the attendance list of the hearings, saw some names that I knew. Leslie Bass was there. Um, I was there. I saw, um, I didn't write it down because I was not memorializing things. There was another name that I recognized from being Duggar related. Amy King. I believe is Duggar related. Um, and then there were others that were just like iPhone or just a phone number that didn't have names. So there could have absolutely been others present that didn't have their name up there, knowing that there were lots of media outlets on that call as well. And they can see everything. So um, PK Nib asked a great question. How can they save victims of these images? I put two resources down below that deal with this more specifically than I do. I only worked at the prosecutorial end. I did not work at the, the end of trying to um, investigate and deal with all of the surrounding circumstances of exploited children. But there are two um, resources in the description of the video for websites that deal with this for exploited uh, children. And I would just refer you to that, to those resources, because I don't have a great answer for that. Um. So question, I have serious issues with this done via Zoom. That sounds like a statement. Now I'm just being sassy. I really feel like the judge may have seen things differently had she been face to face with the custodians, especially the wife. COVID restrictions and local court rules require some of these things still to be done via Zoom. So those that is related to COVID restrictions and uh that's related to COVID restrictions. Look, the judge questioned them pretty thoroughly. And at the end of the day, the judge was satisfied with the answers that they got. She seemed uncomfortable to me. But again, that's the judge determination. So it might've been different in person, 
also COVID courts are still dealing with COVID restrictions. So Joyce, I know, I know. <laughs> Mark request it big to move your head. A uh, poor B. He he was like, I don't know. Move my head where? Um questions. If the custodians change their minds, ooh, there would probably be a hearing. But he could be remanded. Um welcome to the channel. All right, I'm gonna say I've got to say good night, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for <laughs> it being shot glasses is not a bad idea, Miss Vet. Ah, uh, so, um, Marilyn, how does someone so sheltered learn how to use the internet this way? I grew up with AOL and Napster and have no idea how and when the internet went sideways. Um, I don't know if I want to answer that question on live stream because I don't want to help people figure this shit out. There are ways, there are ways, there are ways. So the federal... Federal prison does not have the same type of good behavior that local does. So time does not get sliced up the same way in federal that it does. Um, Nicole said the wife was very uncomfortable. My bit, she, uh, same. She seemed very uncomfortable to me. So that's, I mean, my perspective. All right, you guys. Thank, I can't, thank you. This was a lot. This was a lot, a lot to take, to take in. Um, this was a lot to take in. I appreciate you guys being respectful in the chat. Can we just, just thank the mods uh, for, for doing an extra ride. It's a long week. It's late and it's really fucking heavy. Like the mods knew we were getting in here to talk about CSAI and CP and Josh Duggar and knew that this was going to be, um, be dealt with. So it's a lot to take on, on, on a single to Mayo Wednesday night. Like it's a whole lot. So a huge thank you to the mods. I appreciate you so much. Um, oh, oh, this was a lot. I appreciate you. I don't have any other words. This is heavy stuff. Thank you for being respectful. Thank you for being willing to have the hard conversations. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd. Go ahead and hit the, hit the thumbs up on your way out. Um, I'm not monetizing this video. So if you see ads on it and you're in the replay crew, uh, YouTube has done that. Not me. There are resources in the, in the description box. I will see members only for the live tomorrow night. We have a members only, um, zoom call coming up. That will be in the community tab for channel members Friday night. We will be here at seven o'clock to do other shit. Not this shit. We will be doing much lighter topics on Friday, a little bit of a this week in law and a bunch of popping champagne to celebrate my birthday, purple hair and hitting a hundred thousand subscribers. Friday is going to be much, much more jovial. We will tell stories. Um, I, we will, if we talk about the Chauvin case, I will only tell the story about a juror that we had to question for potential jury misconduct. And the juror misconduct involved him asking me out on a date in the middle of trial. I'll tell that story on Friday. If y'all remind me, we're going to, we're going to tell stories and have a little bit of fun on Friday with purple hair. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, cheers with water. Everybody have a shower and uh, get some sleep. The internet is a is a deep is a deep dark place and i'm not just talking about tiktok so that that members i will see you guys tomorrow night everybody else i appreciate you i thank you for being here i'll see you on friday good night and thank you goodbye connect with me everywhere i'm at the emily d baker if you guys want to join the text just text emily.com if you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com, happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube 